Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah welcome to islamic finance podcast with me Almi Cholan. we just uh, finished recording today's episode and i wanted to let you know that from now on all of our episodes inshallah will be released on mondays i hope that will make it easy for you to follow and make a schedule when to listen because you know it's a beginning of the week new episode is coming inshallah so Miriam, how are you today how's everything going with you I have a few things due this week, but it's okay. Busy week. Student so, life. Yeah, student life. Um, it's it's very good. I mean, that's one of the things, uh, the benefit of this corona. Uh, for those who are able to focus on learning something, it really gives them time and opportunity to do that. But before we go, uh, we have a very important thing to do, and uh, that is our uh, simultaneous sip. So, bismillah. Coffee is beautiful, huh? You had a bit of a water. I have also tea for later on when it's cooled down. So, actually, I learned uh, this week about the coffee uh, that uh, it's not good to have it on empty stomach in the morning. So, apparently, you have to do uh, take something nice and easy in the morning, maybe a bit of water and a lemon, and then you sort of eat, and then coffee. So, that's that's apparently better for for the system and um, in the morning your your metabolism your energy goes up so the coffee adds a little bit to that so it's sort of working with your system and so that is good because that's the time we are recording these podcasts exactly when energy goes up we have a little bit of a coffee our listeners they participate so that makes everything better so uh, even the corona i think it's it's much more easier to handle the corona uh, if if you do that so alhamdulillah that's very good so today we are talking about uh, three pillars of Islamic economy, and uh, it's based on what I call a shepherd's model. I presented paper last year in Istanbul about this, talked to a lot of people. I have made some changes to the model, sort of looking to refine it, and also I'm looking forward to your feedback, because I would like to uh, continue to sort of think about and uh, modify uh, the model itself. I was actually last night reading some of the Aristotle's work uh, regarding it and some of his thoughts, and he he thought of economy as a household management that implies a choice. So last time we said that economy is relation between uh, uh, production, trade, and supply of money, and economics is then that area of study that uses scarce resources, which have alternative use in some way. And uh, we said before that this life is something where we are tested. Everybody is tested with something that they already have, what they're going to do with it. And they are also tested sometimes with a, with a lack of something, how they're going to behave in that situation. So throughout all of our life, everyone, if, if you are rich, what are you going to do with that money. If you are poor, will you be sort of patient? If you have a good health, if you don't have health, if you have a certain relationship in your life that might be good or might be bad, uh, if you have some problems or difficulties, stress, everyone is challenged in different ways. So that, that life is the test. So we all have certain, if you want to call them privileges, something that we should grateful for. And um, we all have certain blessings that we should be thankful for. So I guess when it comes to economy and society, the question that we need to ask is, how do we get the products and services that we consume? Who is producing them? Like when you think about most of your products that you are using in your daily life, how do you get them? Who is making these things? I think more recently I've been trying to go for more natural products or from small businesses. And because like, uh, for example, with the modest fashion, um, it's really easy to find small businesses because a lot of businesses, what I've noticed they do is they find one product and it suits one type of person and they produce that product in various, you know, colors, lengths, whatever, whatever, various um, lifestyles as well. 
So I've been, I think I've been trying to support small businesses more recently, just so that you're aware of from start to end, how those product have been produced. Mm. That's one way, one thing that I've been looking at because I've realized that if you go to like the larger stores and stuff, a lot of the time it's not suited for at least for my lifestyle, whether it's at home or outside. So just kind of being aware process and it's nice to see that. So consuming and being aware of the brand, they may be like a story and their product. Yeah. It's sort of, um, you say it's a nice, it's sort of more like, uh, how would you describe it, it versus feels, big brand? Mm, it feels more like a personal business transaction. It feels like you're dealing with someone you know, mm. even though they're on the other side of the world, for example. And that's, that's actually going to be conclusion of today's <laughs> whole discussion is that um, we live in society where businesses became too big and um, and the government also became too big. So a lot of the uh, solutions to our real daily life uh, come from either big government delivering something or come from really big business delivering something. And people who work for either of these Really, it's almost like they don't have a face, they don't have a voice. Mm -hmm. It's almost like they humanize. And so when you reach to the point of um, knowing the person who produce, you almost feel like you have a relationship and connection mm -hmm. with that person and mm -hmm. the product. So that, that brings me to another point, which is that how did the people used to produce and do these kinds of things before? Must have been more like that, more sort of localized mm. community. Everyone was kind of more entrepreneurial. Yeah. And now these products actually, they have much higher premium. Yeah. So if I'm making like a cream, let's say, mm. face cream, for example, or a hijab or something, and I'm doing it in my house, I'm doing it and it's a personalized, it, it has some, some sort of much more value. There is something uh, uh, there. I would imagine also those people involved in their own business, they, they are much more happier. I think Adam Smith talks about in his Wealth of Nation, something connected to the corporate governance, uh, which came about as a question really more and more when the limited liability company came about, which is that people who are owners of the wealth, of the money, the way they would manage their assets is different than somebody else. And so that created sort of this agency dilemma that someone doing something with your money in a, let's say, big corporation, they will do it differently than someone who is directly doing it for themselves, for their own company and uh, dealing directly uh, with the customers. And so that's interesting that you make because uh, I definitely sense that there has been a breakdown in the communities as a society, community, neighborhood we used to be more entrepreneurial and people were more responsive. That was not only in a sense of producing things, but helping anybody. Mm -hmm. And we all know a situation where difference between you actually giving, let's say, charity to someone with your own hand versus just you click and it goes to some sort of big organization, they deliver it. Maybe they send you the picture or they put post generic. You have that reward, inshallah, for helping but it doesn't touch your heart exactly. Mm. And that's, I think, in economy, what we are sort of losing. It's we are losing the human beings. There is no that connection with what we are consuming or how we are even helping other human beings. That is then filtered in relationship between the people, the families, all of these traditional institutions that used to keep society together. So in order to think about Islamic economy, and how, how we can um, frame the whole discussion. I try to come up with a methodology or a way of thinking about it. Currently, whenever you talk about economy, there are two basic domains or ways that humans are deciding how to manage that household society and how they respond to these challenges. So one is socialism and another one is capitalism. Many people then ask, where does Islamic economy fit? And how does it relate to these other systems? 
those who classify Islamic economy with respect to socialism or capitalism, I would say they are not do, doing a service to Islam. In fact, they're doing disservice. Reason for this is that basic principle that underpins these ideas and what they are trying to accomplish are not often considered. So if you look at each of these systems, uh, socialism and capitalism, you'll see that they are trying to have very different outcomes. They have very different norms. They have their very different values. And then how that plays out in a practice is very different. So when I think about Islamic response to these things and what would be our model, because you, you look at the books, they are not f uh, putting this idea in a, a form, in a model. They are just randomly talking about, oh, there are some partnership, there is uh, Zekia, this is how to sell, this is how to buy, and so on. There is no any way to unite. Even this morning I was listening to a video and somebody was explaining Islamic system, Islamic financial system. And they start with typical explanation where, oh, the capitalism is built on riba, and therefore Islam prohibits riba, and therefore something really is... Is capitalism built on riba? Is that, is that the main thing? Is that what you build it on? That for me is very superficial understanding of the capitalism. The, the system that produce latest technology, latest healthcare advances, everything that we use today, that's what builds the system. Usury and other prohibited ways of finance is a completely different issue than, than that. That may be affecting how the wealth is distributed or concentrated in certain heads or something like that. That's more to, uh, to do with manipulation and other things. But to say that that was the reason, no, the reason is that they are producers. They are producing. They are using the, whatever way they are financing these things. And, and by the way, most of, the, uh, most of that and startups and everything is financed through equity, not through debt, mm -hmm. even until today. So we are just purely ignoring the side of production. Just like socialism. You think socialism didn't have an interest in all of these things. Why are they not successful? Because they fundamentally were not producing as efficient and so on. And so when we talk about Islamic economic system, then we cannot mix up everything in the one bag. Therefore, I've been thinking about it. This is what I came up with. So the shepherd's model is constructed on the f famous hadith where he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said that every one of you is a shepherd and is responsible for his flock. So from this statement, we can extract what I call a shepherd's model. By the way, this model equally relates to leadership, management, and economy. So in this part, I will specifically look how it relates to economy. So when you look at a shepherd, by their nature, they make decisions that impact the uh, flock. Since every one of us is a shepherd, we all have some responsibility. So how do we understand this hadith then? I remember uh, one time I, I heard my teacher discuss this hadith long, long time ago. And as for some reason, this stuck with me. So he said, did you ever look at the shepherd? And what is the job that he's doing? When I was a young, I remember behind my house in Bosnia, in Sarajevo, we used to have beautiful forest and a, a green field. And we would always run away behind our houses as a kids. And there were shepherds there. So I remember what he's saying. I can relate. And he said, if you look at the shepherd, one of the things that you will notice is that he will often pick up the uh, young or the weak animal and he will carry it in its arms. He said this is their first job. He's gently carrying for the weak lamp in his arm and that is what we call to take care of the weak ones. Then if you observe a bit more some of these animals, they might run away, run around so second job is that he collects the scattered ones that run away. And then the third responsibility 
is that he leads the strong ones. Where does he lead them? Well, he leads them towards the green areas. So he can see the green area there, green area there, or a danger. So he can take them to these areas, and they might not realize what is happening, what is, where is the opportunity. These three domains, in summary, taking care of the weak, gather the scattered ones, and lead the strong ones. This is the job of the shepherd. So when the Prophet is talking about you all are the shepherds, these are the kind of things that we are talking about. This is the functional role. Now, in that time, people understood the role of the shepherd. And prophets, they, were, uh, they had that sort of responsibility. And so I think that our entire economic system could be described by these three areas of responsibility or pillars. So based on this, we could say then, number one, taking care of the weak is all about circulation and distribution of the wealth. Anything to do with not-for-profit, charity, and the way the money moves around. So that's a distribution of the wealth piece. Then, then there is a gather the scattered and the lost. This is really about a borders, the edge. You see, when you have prohibition in Islamic finance or economy, it tells you you can do whatever you want up to here, like in a soccer field. We, in Islam, we have two types of action. One is ibadat, another one is muamalat. So ibadats are acts of worship, and they are usually prescriptive. You pray your maghrib three units, okay? That's very specific. You can't now say, can I pray four or ten? or No, that's three units. And you cannot just keep changing, thinking of doing the good thing. So that's, that's a type of, that's a worship. Anything towards God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we do it according to those prescribed ways. But when it comes to dealing with the people, between the people, muamalat, the rule is opposite. Everything is permissible between the people unless there is a clear prohibition that you cannot do that. So the way we, for example, eat, how to cook the food, what type of food to eat with what. You eat whatever you want, however you want, however you want to cook it. Mm-hmm. Islam doesn't say, no, the eggs you have to cook this way, chicken this way, you know, lamb. Islam tells you, you can prepare, then cook and eat anything you want, except one, two, and three. Okay, these foods, don't touch these things. The rest, whatever you want. If you want to eat chocolate with a lamb, barbecue, it's up to you. It doesn't make sense, but it's up to you. I told you, I've seen people eat crazy things. Mm. Chili sauce with strawberries and things like, for me, that's, but some people, they love that. But now Islam doesn't say, no, it's haram, you know. Islam says, whatever whatever makes you happy, do that. Uh, As long as you don't go beyond something that is prohibited or against certain aims and objectives of the Sharia. These borders are there then to define where the game is. And and we can think of it like a game of soccer. You play the game inside the border, and uh, you can use any techniques to play the game better and efficient and more beautiful. As long as you don't do certain prohibited acts within that border, you can play the game. A rule is there to define the border, beyond which we shouldn't be either making profit or transacting and similar. And the rule is to uh, focus attention to where the game should be, to make it beautiful and, and, and fun to watch. When you are gathering the lost and the scattered one, you really want them to be in an environment where it's protected by these rules and regulations. And one of the aims of the Sharia is protection of the wealth. So it's all to do with protection individually and for the society. So we could call this gathering of the lost and scattered one, it's related to ethics, rules and regulations, and I call it protection of the wealth. The third piece is leading the strong, and that is often the most forgotten piece. We all talk about how to spend it and give it and all of these things, but what is often missing in our way of thinking is wealth creation piece. If you think about economy as a whole, as a circle, I usually draw it on the board for students as a circle, and you start from at the bottom and you go up, based on how much wealth people have. 
you know, at the bottom people don't have much wealth and then the next level people with more wealth and, and so on. And then you intersect uh, that circle with different lines and different industries and different things that people consume. Usually more wealth that you have, more you, spend. more you can spend, more you can get yourself. Like Let's say even now this corona treatment, mm-hmm. how many people can have corona treatment by those cocktails that provide the uh, immunity boost to help them? Not many people. Based on how much wealth they have, Islam would prescribe many ways that we distribute and ethically deal with this distribution and circulation of the money. But at the same time, the core component in order to distribute and help other people move to have those services and benefits comes from ability to create wealth, to make money. Okay, and that's often neglected piece. So the three pillars then of economy in the shepherd's model are number one, uh, wealth distribution, number two, wealth protection, and then uh, wealth creation. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, that makes sense. So if we look at the first uh, pillar, wealth distribution, so this is what we said, taking care of the weak, it's where non-for-profit wealth circulates, it's more charitable, it's a first pillar of a wholesome Islamic economy. And it talks about capacity to take care of the weak. This piece really is about moral leadership for the well-being of the society. And it talks about capacity to take care of those who are in need. The function, this pillar, is built on virtues like empathy, compassion, gratitude, where Islam legislates several mechanisms. For instance, we said zakat, sadaqa, waqf, benevolent loans, takaful, even the way it breaks the wealth when you have inheritance laws. In this economic context, uh, we talk about circulation, distribution uh, of the wealth, and Mufti Takiusmani explains that objectives of an economic system is that wealth produced in a society must be distributed in a just and fair manner so that it may not be concentrated in the hands of a few people. There is a short verse that supports this idea, which says, so that it may not circulate only between the rich among you. Quran 59.7. When we talk about this idea, we are not talking about socialist understanding of the welfare state. When we're talking about these things, we need to differentiate between state, business, community, individual, to what degree uh, and, and why and how this money is circulated, who has what responsibility. So if we look at, uh, let's say, socialism, this task of distribution comes down to government taking ownership of most of the wealth in order to eliminate different classes between people. This idea aims to distribute wealth by focusing on collective need rather than individual efforts. In, in capitalism... The distribution of the wealth is a concept that is more left to individual and to their kind of sense of benevolence and to handle it as they see kind of fit. When we look at this, we could see that both of these have certain shortcomings. For instance, if you look at socialism, it's built on the idea of uh, atheism. God is out of the picture for them. People, in a sense, and this may be a bit ideological uh, sort of uh, framing, maybe some people will not immediately see the relevance of this because not everybody who is atheist is part of those people who believe in this idea. But sometimes we ignore the deep ideology and how it came about, this system. And I lived in this society in former Yugoslavia, so I know intimately ultimate end. So while we see many Muslims and some Christians and others supporting many of the socialist idea, I think that's come basically from not understanding where it's going. Where it's yeah. going. Like how many people do you know that would even think deeply where about it's going? it? No one. no one. They really look at it on a surface level. Yeah. And the surface level would be like hating the government or hating the capitalism. Yeah. And therefore, this is alternative. And then they would win over by saying uh, some nice-sounding slogans, which people like. 
but they, what they wouldn't talk about is that how they're going to pay for it. So you will often see that solution by these people is just take more money from the people and government. Somebody in government will deliver solution. Yeah? So everything basically runs on that idea for these things come basically from atheism. You know, maybe I'll now say something people would not like it, but when you think about it, you will realize yeah. that the essence comes from that idea. And over the time, it manifests like that in a practice, whether we agree or disagree with it. When the God is out of the picture for those who created the system, people are basically promised that their insecurities and needs will be taken care of by the states instead of individual and community working freely together. So that, that's a problem right there. And we see that destruction of the families today. Oh, that's okay. We'll just assign social worker for you to take yeah. care of you. And then you are old. Yeah. Don't worry. Don't need to kids. No, nothing. And so we see more and more. That's why that big government is a security and insurance policy for many of the people who think like that. Inevitably, a concentration of wealth and power in socialist system opens the way to corruption and inferior decisions. That's why you see most of the system collapse totally. They're not yeah. able to take care of. In the early stages, when they make big decisions, half of the country will do, let's say, manufacturing, half will go do the production, produce potatoes and the grains. And Okay, so then progress is fast. But after a while, inefficiency and everything starts destroying the system. And the reason for this is that Complex choices cannot be sufficiently managed by bureaucracy that is not based on those specific competencies. If you look at any organization, any, let's say, commercial entity, it's people who, who deserve it based on the merits, based on the competencies and so on, and all of the skills that work within hierarchy that tackles the problem, they, they go up. In a bureaucracy, it's a completely different set of skills and rewards loyalty and party preferences and so on. And when these people manage something, it, it leads to a lot of different failures. So this way of engaging with challenges of life ends up destroying wealth and incentives and those motivations that produce work. Now, problem with the capitalism on the other side is not simply, oh, it's now Everybody free. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Free markets. These are all another fake story by those who just blindly following capitalism. Okay. On that side, when we talk about capitalism, much of the distribution and care for weak are left without clear guidelines and value based incentives as to how individuals should contribute to the needs of society. So it's easy to say you'll have less tax and then everything will be fine. But in a society that is more and more removed from religion and these uh, incentives that connects you with these benevolent actions, there is no guarantee that these people will be responsible when it comes to taking care of the weak. So much of the practices in capitalism is then focused on minimizing taxes, reducing the size of the government and growing corporations. Now, that in itself is not a bad thing mm. because the government uh, that just keeps taking more and more, it's a, it's a big question mark because taking your money, mm. for, let's say income tax, it's, it's something that is objectionable even though when it is used for the good. So it's, it's a, one of those big topics that we, again, don't think about too deeply what did morally and ethically mean when I take 30% of your tax? Do I have a right? So there is a question, big question mark on that. And what is the role of the government? But I will park that very controversial question for the moment. Notice just that it's not just as people see today when they almost think it's a virtue it's a moral right of the government to take your money. It's not. You need to justify taking someone's money and have a pretty good justification if you want to make a moral case out of it. So much of it is, as I say, is focused on minimizing 
uh, the tax. Mm -hmm. An assumption here is made on the back of the idea that humans are by their nature, benevolent. let's say, hmm? benevolent. Yeah, like benevolent, rational, or they will do something, or they know how best to spend their money. Again, th these are in general true mm -hmm. statements. They know people should not just know how to spend their money. That's not even the question. It's when it's your money, it's your money. <laughs> you do whatever you want, whether you know or don't know. Who is bureaucrat in the government elected with votes and campaigning to tell you what to do with money? But when it comes to helping the weak, challenge with capitalism is that it depends on people for a moral compass. So even if we agree with underlying some of these assumptions, the core here is people and their moral compass. And so we see that capitalism is mute to what these values actually are. Critics of capitalistic society will rightfully point out that tax benefits alone are not enough to inspire people to take care of those who are mostly in need in the community. Because there are no specific rules that governs the benevolent side of capitalistic society, there is evident loss of trust in people who assure us that excess wealth will trickle down. Mm. Okay? As corporations under capitalism grow, we end up with the same situation as we have under socialism. Now, again, this will be very controversial for a lot of people. No, no, they will say, no, 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 no. We don't end up with the same. Capitalism is completely different. Socialism is completely different. This one is focusing on the group. This one on the individual. This one concentrate wealth here. This one in the, in the... But what I'm talking about is that at the end, you end up in a situation where more and more decisions are concentrated in the hands of few. So capitalism leads to the big businesses and the decisions more and more and all of the freedoms and all of these free markets and everything mm -hmm. is concentrated in very few and socialism leads to concentration oh. of everything in the government. In that aspect, they begin to mirror each other. Yeah. And often you'll see that they will do some manipulations, whether it's how the law is exercised or legislations are passed that will start to favor certain people. So the system, they will rig the system in their favor. Like, for example, currently, you know, I don't want to bring too much politics, but president of U.S. now is currently in the news that he paid little taxes, federal taxes. He paid some other taxes, but now the people who defend him, they say, okay, you don't understand depreciations, and he had losses which he offset later on. Okay. And these are incentives for building economy. That's fine. But here's the problem. Did he offset the losses or did he create accounting gymnastics to create illusion that there were some losses which he offset later on? These are the questions that people are asking. And these are very legitimate questions because the core comes that we don't know if we should believe the people. We don't see their moral compass. At the moment, those who use those loopholes, they simply are saying we are just being smart. The game is that I find a creative way to avoid, not because of this fits with the essence of those rules. In the end, we see that decisions and regulation is in both capitalism and socialism become correlated with specific interest groups instead of the interest of the end consumer and justice. This is why in recent times we have seen calls to abandon capitalism, which is not able to uh, be trusted to respond to the growing inequalities in society. The same appeal is heard in communist countries that are abandoning socialism. So it is only Islam that holistically handles the aspect of taking care of the weak by legislating and fairly encouraging various instruments of wealth distribution. By legislating specific mechanisms and incentives, Islam removes uncertainty from society with regards to who is responsible for what. Let's look at zakat, for example, which is poor due. So zakat, as a percentage, let's say, of the wealth, not, not income, wealth. 
zakat is taken as an exact amount and given to particular groups of people in society for a very specific purpose. In fact, in order to preserve the dignity of people that are given zakat, Islam looks at zakat as a right of poor and needy and not charity from the wealthy. Mm. And this mindset build positive approach where wealthy members of society are not seen as a higher or privileged class, but as a force for good, such as when Uthman radiallahu anhu gave the whole caravan to the needy people in Medina. This example of Uthman radiallahu anhu brings us to the, another instrument, which is sadaqa, general charity, which encourages consistency in giving as a part of Islamic lifestyle. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, the best of deeds is that which are done consistently, even if it is little. So this attitude of giving is also extended to all tangible and intangible deeds, so much so that even smiling is considered charity in Islam. So this shows that the simple reality of life, which is that all of us are in need of different things all the time. Somebody might need food, money, smile, or understanding. Furthermore, institutions such as endowments, wakuf, can solve big problems in society. You were recently in Turkey and you saw mm. tens of thousands of buildings uh, belongs to wakuf. wakuf yeah. And you were telling me about um, one of them that feeds, for example, students. students. Mm -hmm. How much it costs to eat, for example, in Istanbul as a student these days. As a student? If you say you're a student... You can eat for three liters. Mm. You can get a meal with a drink. like. And how much would that be liters. in Australian dollars? In Australian dollars, that would be like 80 cents, I think, 80, 90 cents. Right. And that's uh, And that's wakf. businesses. And wakfs, some wakfs give free meals. Some wakfs, it would be like one liter and 30 mm. cents of their cents, which would be 25, 30 Australian cents. Mm. And I have spoken with the head of Aukaf in Turkey some years ago when he came here. And um, he was telling me that uh, you have Aukaf there that, for example, take care of stray cats and dogs. Uh, you have something like, I think, from memory, if I'm not saying there's 20,000 Aukafs with about 80,000 people who work. Another idea, Islamic laws of inheritance that breaks the wealth in society and how it circulates and so on. By... Circulating goodness in society, we are keeping each other safe. So this generous attitude is a precondition mm. for a society that is built on trust, without resentment, mm. classes and borders between people. And only people who establish these bonds can establish society that even you talked about mm. just now, where we know each other, we trade, and everybody is involved, everybody is in power. Because we are hardwired to be social, to cooperate. This is the building block whose full power will be realized later when we talk about last uh, pillar of Islamic economy. A second pillar, wealth protection. This is where we talk about gathering the scattered and the lost. It's all about ethics, rules, and regulations. When we talk about regulatory protection, it's all about safeguarding the economic system so it does not engage in activities that have detrimental impact on society. At the same time, these rules, they defend against commercial activities that are prohibited, such as, for example, riba or garar and similar. So adal or justice in profit making is to make profit from for-profit activities only, not to make profit from activities that are not supposed to be for-profit activities. And this is a handful, but later on we'll explain what this whole piece means. It's, it's a very interesting discussion, but it's a very complex for this uh, time to go too deeply. So these rules prevent activities that might undermine the trust and spirit of partnership in society. Example, deceptive financial techniques and transactions that uh, profit from others' ignorance. Example is most recent global financial a crisis, many regulators limited, for instance, financial practices known as short selling due to their harmful effect on real businesses. 
but lifted them soon after the crisis was over. Unfortunately, the lack of regulation and consistency can move system towards creating incentives that reward those who can take advantage of weak members in society. So with subsequent post-GFC bailouts, we have seen the emergence of hybrid economic system that often combines the worst elements of socialism and capitalism. And that's where we are today, because there is no system that's purely capitalist or socialist. They are always these hybrid. Post-GFC, we have seen the worst of both combined in the way that the stimulus and the whole response was working. And one of the economists that predicted a lot of these problems, uh, Nouriel Rubini noted, when profits are privatized and losses, losses are socialized, are socialized. We get sleazy capitalism and corporate welfare that becomes public bailout of reckless lenders. When they profit, they all become capitalists. When they are in a loss, and this we talk about the America, when they are lost, then we become socialist and we spread the losses. And that's where the unfair, unfair system comes. So people who are purely ideological about any of these systems, they don't recognize a lot of these things. But after Corona, we have another problem. We have the third issue, which is that debt is nationalized yeah. in massive ways. Look at us in Australia, 25 million people. So far, stimulus in terms of a debt, hundreds of billions of dollars. I think mm -hmm. I read this last one was 300 billion, just for a couple of months. What were the main problems during the 2008 financial crisis? Well, there are two very small points I'll just mention here is that one was speculative trade with various financial instruments that Islam prohibits and the short selling I mentioned. This is the sale uh, where you sell something that you don't have, which Islam prohibits. And the other one was artificial creation of debt with financial instruments that utilize sale of money to make a profit. Both of these transactions are prohibited in Islam. So for instance, Prophet Sallallahu said, it is not permissible to land on the condition of a sale or to have two conditions in one transaction or to sell what you do not have. That's eliminate short selling and these other speculative mm -hmm. instruments. And another hadith, it says, do not sell gold for gold unless equal in weight. And that eliminates packaging that, securitizing it and selling it like we have seen uh, CDOs, those credit default obligations and other instruments. The purpose of this prohibition in Sharia is to eliminate lazy mentality that seeks to profit without providing real benefits of the society. So this, this is what we are talking about when it comes to protecting the wealth, rules and regulations. And that's why I say riba, just like any other border, is to prevent that lazy mentality. If you in the soccer could pick up the ball in your hands and go around the border and then score, well, that's not a real game then. We don't have a game. You don't need even athleticism to do that. If that's going to be the rule, then, then there is no sport. So it's a very lazy way of playing. You don't develop yourself. It's not fun anymore. It's nothing. It becomes just cheating. Islam tried to eliminate this lazy mentality that seeks to profit without providing real benefit. Or to profit from certain speculative transactions that profit from catastrophic market events. Therefore, we could say that benefit of these Islamic commercial regulation is that it links profit incentives with work that is solving real needs in society. We only win as a society if our wins originate from the benefit that we produce in that same society. Unfortunately, most of today's regulatory principles rely on limited human perception and lack of objective grounding. And so this pillar deals with avoiding injustice and, and the zulum. The third pillar. So the first pillar we said, distribution of the wealth. is taking care of the needy and weak and, and so on. Right? These are not commercial for-profit transactions. This is not what growing economy. This has different impact on economy. It does to indirectly impact the growth growth and everything else as you bring people into economy as participants, okay? But this is consumers. The third one is the rules of the game. This is the gathering, the scattered ones, the ethics, and so 
you are leveling the playing field in terms of the ethics and regulations. And that incentives for producing work are connected with you producing the real benefit and not trying to profit from people's ignorance, from some speculative, harmful activities and so on. Now, the third comes to leading the strong. This is the wealth creation. Now, this is where real economic, commercial and financial, this is where the engine of growth of economy is. This is where surplus is created. This is what powers the first category so you can give. This is what is regulated by second category. This domain is connected with entrepreneurship. It drives human potential towards the justice and thriving economic system. If I just look at this domain at the highest level, when it comes to producing the goods and services, this benefits people because it helps them to take care of their needs. As well, it creates the jobs that people can do to take care of themselves. But the idea here is that it becomes much more culture of the whole society. In every society, you'll have some big businesses, middle businesses, and small businesses, and some people working for someone. But the core backbone on every society is that middle. You want the strong middle. This is your back. So some of these people will have huge businesses, and, and some challenges require really a, a, a massive number of people to cooperate to solve them. For example, let's say you're making a car factory. You need a huge business. It's not going to be the backyard, small business, yeah, operation. But what you don't want to lose is that entrepreneurial risk-taking community that is able to tackle with new things and, and so on. To give you a simple example, look at now Apple. Many people think, okay, who can now compete with Apple in terms of the iPhones, MacBooks, things like that? And I was speaking with, you, with my son, your brother, uh, the other day, and he, th he told me something very interesting. He said, what if Tesla started making phones and the computers? And as he said it, I, I thought, my goodness, like, I never thought about it. But given his experience with SpaceX and technology and innovation, other things, that would be one of the brands that I think if they enter into that space, they would probably compete very successfully with Apple on many different ways. So you want to have these people from that culture of entrepreneurship that you have risk takers who are empowered to solve these problems in society. So this is the piece we are talking about, leading the strong. When you look at the shepherd, he's got that vision. Yeah. Benefit of that vision is that the shepherd can look around and map the terrain and they can then start imagining what's possible. If the shepherd then take initiative to build something, you have that leadership. In different economic system, for example, decisions might be centralized, like in a uh, socialist system. It is challenging to ignite the human creativity without that personal sense of freedom to take a risk and to have a reward to benefit from that incentive. Yeah. That is why we can see countries where socialism used to dominate for a long time, like China, Russia, and India. And we'll talk next time about, for example, China, how it had to eliminate these constraints in order to create hybrid system that it is now. But while they were under this restricted, centralized decision-making system, they were not very successful. So they had to integrate some free market mechanism in order to deal with complexities that modern economy and business demand. Capitalism in that regard was able to drive human progress by creating solutions that change the way we live today. Problem with capitalism, unfortunately, also came about from misunderstanding human nature that thrives in a free environment, but also can quickly turn against itself if unrestricted in its misguidance. If you have no ethical or faith based incentives to guide humans in this area of free market. You don't get trickled down. You will not get trickled down. It's not going to work for everybody. People will be left behind. Mm. So capitalism was able to figure out commercial incentives to drive the human progress. But they totally misunderstood, just like socialism misunderstood commercial instincts and nature of human beings, Capitalism misunderstood non-commercial incentives that drive people to become benevolent. So when it comes to Islamic third pillar 
when it comes to the wealth creation, we could say ethical wealth creation, wholesome wealth creation. This is where, again, Islam shines very brightly. The problem is that most of Muslims actually forgot their own history to see that. So, for example, if people today credit uh, Adam Smith as a father of modern economics and capitalism, but it is actually Ibn Khaldun in, in his Muqaddima who much more clearly established these principles around 400 years before Adam Smith. Mm. Now, what inspired Ibn Khaldun and other scholars to encourage freedom to conduct commerce? These were Islamic principles. For example, if you read in Quran, it is mentioned, or you who have believed, do not consume one another's wealth unjustly, but only in lawful businesses by mutual consent. I don't want to go now into the income tax and other things, and this is relevant to that part because that's another whole topic. But look at this, only by mutual consent. Don't consume each other's wealth. Don't take each other's wealth. You, you can't do that. You can only do it mutual with consent in transaction and so on. Another narration says that it was narrated that Enes ibn Malik said, the people said, O Messenger of Allah, prices have become too high. Fix the prices for us. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Allah is the one who decrees prices, who takes and gives, and he is the provider. I hope that I will meet Allah with no one among you making any claim against me concerning issues of blood or wealth. So it is not just enough that we compete in a free way, but we must do so while keeping certain ethical constraints in mind. For instance, Islamic partnership contract like Musharaka states that contracting parties can negotiate profit sharing ratio, but when it comes to loss, it is always based on capital contribution. So, mean you want to go business? 60-40. 40, whatever. Maybe I invested 90%, you invested 10%. But I tell you, okay, I'll give you 50% of the profit and I'll take 50%. Okay? Mm-hmm. So, why would I do that? Or maybe you have some skills, or some knowledge. And I generally want to encourage you to work hard. Yeah. So you grow a pie. Yeah. So I don't mind you taking a larger share in the profit because this is now incentives. But when it comes to the loss, it only goes by contribution, initial capital contribution. So we lose $100, you lose 10 I lose 90 mm-hmm. Now, is that fair? It's definitely it's very fair. There's a huge wisdom in these things mm-hmm. because when you are initially negotiating... Mm-hmm. It's very easy that big bank or institution force a weaker, smaller party to take disproportionate amount of risk and losses and so on. And so it's not fair in that aspect. But to give more incentives at a profit, that, that is actually a positive thing for both sides. I'll give you an example. In this case scenario, is it better that a business returns a million dollars and we share, uh, I don't know, 90, 10. In that case, you make 100,000, and I make 900. Or is it better that uh, business returns $100 million, and we share 50-50? It's better that I create a bigger business, bigger, more incentives, and then although ratio or uh, uh, percentage looks smaller, but outcome is far bigger. So this arrangement incentivizes wealth creation while preventing the injustice of moving undeserved risk from stronger to the weaker party. This also builds an entrepreneurial culture that contributes to the welfare of society via the production of goods, services, and similar. Prohibition of riba actually helps that, so that the effort and incentives are moved into this side of the equation. Do you see how that works together? Leading strong is therefore structured around Islamic principles that says that the best way to make a gain is from work of our own hands. This work could be related to anything from agriculture, manufacturing, to other beneficial products and services. Benefit from doing things by our hands is that we increase skills and efficiency in producing something tangible. Nations that do not produce for their own needs soon lose something more valuable than wealth. They lose skills and confidence as they become more risk-averse, while economic leadership depends on risk-taking and fair profit-sharing. By working and developing skills, we also build confidence. It is only with confidence 
that we can take on more significant challenges of our time. So that's the third pillar, leading the strong. So I will just summarize that today we talked about Islamic economy, three key pillars based on the shepherd's model. And these three pillars of Islamic economy are based on wealth distribution, wealth protection, and wealth creation, which is leadership and entrepreneurship. All together, they are designed to push people to be producers, to benefit society, and to solve different kinds of problems. Sometimes by creating the products for majority of the society that we all need in everyday life, and sometimes if there is a surplus, to distribute the wealth and help those who need uh, basics to participate in that economy. Today we started by saying how uh, society moved towards big mega businesses or faceless Faces. brands and corporations, and and we are almost longing for that human connection. Mm. It's actually really interesting. Um, at one time I was working for a few months at this clothing store, and um, every now and then we'd actually get the CEO come in. And one of these days that I was working, he did. He came in and it was really interesting. He looked like a regular shopper. So when I was told, oh, you know, this is the CEO and we get to go and speak to him, um, I could understand why the manager and the people who were there for, you know, five, six, eight, ten years were still working there because they had a direct link with the person who started this. And his story and the way he started is something that we talked about. It's really interesting, you know, when you when you see like this is the person who started the business, this is, you know, and where it is now, you're like, okay, this is a company where I would go and shop there again um, because you trust. You're like, okay, this person, I, I trust what they're doing. I see their vision. I see how passionate they are. And it's not just as a consumer where this is important. It's also important if you're working for that person to know who you're working for. I found that really, really something that I really enjoyed um, while I was there. I, I had a similar experience when uh, I was watching on TV the one day uh, this clothing company again that was producing the clothes from uh, one of the farms around here in this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was in Victoria somewhere. They were saying that this is the farm, maybe fifth or sixth generation, and they have these uh, beautiful sheep. You can you can see the farm and lifestyle. And they made suits by um, collecting the wool from that particular area. Yeah. And just the way they take care of the animals, even the stitching and everything, they do it in the quality way. If you buy a suit from that place, it will have different importance to you, different meaning. And I think you would, you would even take care of it more, you yeah. would, you, it wouldn't be like one of those almost disposables these days. Yeah. yeah, that relationship I think is really important. And I think it really drives the economy a lot better when you have those connections. Structuring uh, economy on the right pillars with the right values will increase participation and it will be uh, much different yeah. than I think what we are seeing today. And the idea really is to have society that is much more happier at the end. Yeah. I think having values as well, having like value-driven society, value-driven consumers and businesses, it will, like you will reward those risk takers and you'll reward those who take the initiative as well. Okay, so that's it from us today. Inshallah, we'll see you next week. Don't forget, next episode from now on will come on Mondays, Inshallah, midday Australian time. Uh, you can send us your questions, feedback, and you can join any of our social media channels that, that are there on our website. I would urge you to join our mailing list so that you get notification when these episodes uh, are released. Take care of yourself and stay safe. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.